Namaste. Welcome to Such Conversations Matter. Conversations which represent the future we should have. I'm your host, Saurabh Nanda. We are back. We were supposed to launch the second season of Such Conversations Matter in the first week of May. And there was a teaser video that I had also released. But everyone knows the the terrible second wave that India was going through, which couldn't allow us uh, to actually launch it. It just didn't feel right. We were occupied with so many other things. And, uh, well, fortunately, things are stabilizing now, or at least going towards a little more stability. And uh, we're finally able to launch uh, the second season of Such Conversations Matter. You might have seen the introductory uh, animation and the background score. Uh, Those are some of the new things uh, that I worked on. There was a fabulous composer I found in Sharad Joshi who actually helped create a very nice background score which kind of represented where I come from, uh, what kind of uh, uh, vibe and feel that such conversations matter um, aims to create. And uh, he, he did a fabulous job. So I, I would love to uh, hear your feedback about that as well. Um, apart from that, we are also working on more changes. Uh, we are trying to expand the horizon of such conversations matter with whatever little resources I have and uh, create many more meaningful conversations and more content around it in the form of written content and so on. The first episode of the second season of such conversations matter is graced by the presence of Dr. Navneet Puller. Dr. Navneet Bhuller is uh, an army kid uh, like myself, and she's traveled. She lived all over India. She's experienced all, uh, you know, a lot of India. And uh, in the early '90s, she went to the U.S. to pursue her career in medicine. But the the sense of giving back to society was always with her. She has uh, volunteered uh, at various organizations like the Sierra Club in the U.S., uh, Doctors Without Borders, which is also called Medicine Sans Frontier. And uh, she's worked in many countries across the world. She divides her time uh, between her home in the U.S. and uh, her uh, native place or, or, you know, ancestral place in Jalandhar. And a few years ago, she also founded uh, an NGO called uh, APAR, which focuses on uh, autistic children and people. Last year, when she was in Jalandhar taking care of her parents, she realized the amount of plastic pollution which is being produced in India, especially during the COVID-19 crisis, and the dismal uh, waste management, the dismal awareness uh, among people and the authorities, and she started talking to like-minded people here in Jalandhar to do something about it. And that is how the Action Group Against Plastic Pollution, or AGAP, was created. She's the founder of AGAP, and I'm privileged to say that I'm a core member of the AGAP uh, NGO today. I'm a joint secretary, and um, I feel privileged to work with all the other professionals who are doctors, lawyers, um, contractors, builders, educators in in the NGO who are trying to save Jalandhar, Punjab, and probably India from the menace of plastic pollution. I'm a very passionate... um, Sustainability enthusiast and plastic pollution, water conservation and youth empowerment are three areas that I talk about a lot. You might have noticed that in season one as well. This conversation is also going to revolve around those things and also about uh, maybe army kids behave in a certain way in their lives uh, and why professionals need to take control of the situation, especially related to their environment. so that they can contribute in making a planet a more livable space. So, I've taken a lot of your time already. <laughs> Let me bring on Dr. Navneet Buller. Hi, Dr. Buller. How are you? Fine, sort of. Thanks. Thank you. I'm excited, a uh, little mortified, but yeah, I'm not used to being interviewed, <laughs> but it's a new experience. <laughs> No, I'm, you don't have to be modified at all. It's it's uh, something that we both feel so passionate about. Uh, we're just going to talk about those things. It's just like one of those conversations that we have uh, in our AGAP meetings and nothing special. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, so let me start off by asking you, uh, you know, a question which I've asked all the guests on season two of uh, Such Conversations Matter. Um 
how was your 2020? So 2020, of course, if I could sum it up in one um, or two words, it would be exciting and productive. Uh, surprisingly, uh, considering what the rest of the world was going through. I got a stretch of, yeah. I got a whole stretch of about seven months in, in the US. I divide, I live in the US and India. And so that was uh, really good because I got to work in COVID wards, which was a very rich experience. And I felt like I could, you know, contribute my little bit. And then um, as a physician, and then uh, it, I had a lot of time, a lot of time for contemplation and writing in that time. Yeah. Well, that's amazing. Uh, I hope you were able to write a lot. Yes, I have many unedited essays in a folder. Uh, hopefully <laughs> to see the light of the day someday. Yeah. We, we would all love to uh, read them someday whenever you feel comfortable with them. Okay. Um, so, ma'am, uh, just to, uh, you know, uh, give everyone a perspective about uh, you and your professional journey so far and the things that you've done in life, uh, would you like to summarize that a little bit? Because only you can do it, uh, you know, in, in the most appropriate manner. All right. So, um, I think, I don't know if, uh, yeah, I think I'll... I should set a little um, background in that. So uh, I, I grew up as an army brat. Uh, uh, I think starting from Mao to Guwahati to a little bit of Siliguri to Calcutta to Punjab to Mathura and then back to Punjab and my dad retired by the time I entered medical college. Um, so I um, went to eight different schools. Um, and one thing that um, I uh, imbibed from my dad who was a nature lover was um, a love for the outdoors and grasping all the grabbing all the opportunities we could to uh, appreciate and uh, enjoy the outdoors, which could be uh, in, range from something as mundane as sleeping on the terrace, whenever we had houses on the upper floors, which sometimes you get flats in the army, but they usually had a terrace, um, or sometimes, uh, or at other times uh, we had in Mathura, there was the golf course was by the, uh, the, the the swimming pool was by the golf course. So we would go swimming in the morning and then uh, late into the evening, lie on the grass in the golf course next to the Yamuna. So we were, yeah, nature, nature, nature was the predominant theme in our lives. And we sort of missed, missed that a lot when dad retired and um, we came to Jalanda and, uh, you know, he had already built a house and we missed nature so much um, then. And, and the other thing that, uh, I inculcated from dad was a love for adventure. What, what people think is adventure, what, uh, what salient thing, or I hate to, I hate to, uh, you know, create this hierarchy or whatever between, you know, civilians and the army, but how, what people think was adventurous was normal for us, you know, picking up our bags and deciding to travel or go for a picnic over the weekend. And, you know, um, wading into rivers as kids when before we had even learned to swim and nobody caring about it because some uncle always knew how to swim and that kind of thing. So yeah, so adventure and uh, nature. So they, they these were the dominant. Want I wanted these to be the dominant themes in my life for the rest of my life. You know, this is what I still yearn for: adventure and nature. And then, and so when I chose my profession, which uh, was medicine, I somehow. I wanted to go, to go into the army first and then gradually uh, during medical college, I decided to go to the U.S. where I got abundant opportunity to indulge in both nature and adventure, usually a combination of the two, and uh, uh, joined, uh, uh, worked with MSF, Medicine Sans Frontier, Doctors Without Borders for some years in a few African and Asian countries combined with uh, earning a livelihood in America. So that's sort of, yeah, sort of the trajectory of my career. And then... Um, and then uh, starting a par about uh, 2014 in Jalandhar, an NGO to rehabilitate adults with intellectual disability. So, and then last year, of course, 2020, I forgot to, uh, 2020 saw the birth of AGAP um, in August when I saw those, <laughs> the misuse of plastic bags going on even when uh, vegetable vendors and fruit vendors came to the doorsteps of courtiers to deliver vegetables and people were, uh, women mostly, sadly, were accepting polythene bags from them. Instead of, you know, they're right at the doorstep, uh, in their house, literally, almost at, the, at their doorstep, they can't get a big burton to get the vegetables or a big thela from inside the house. So that was very painful. And that's what produced a gap. 
I, I wanted to uh, pull out a string from from that uh, you know small little uh, introduction that you gave us uh, as to when you said you know your your life was always uh, surrounded uh, by nature and then uh, you know I, and I think uh, just by association uh, adventure as well and uh, I also being an army kid uh, dad retired from the army I think uh, finally retired from the army in 2015. Uh, you know, again, lived in, lived across India in, uh, studied uh, in eight different schools. Same! Um, eight, the magic number! <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, um, nature was obviously always there. Um, I, I still yearn for those, uh, you know, uh, unventured into uh, grasslands and forests the cantonments has. Uh, they have uh, and you know just taking my cycle and just going and uh, exploring all those areas um do you think that love for nature and uh, that love for adventure somehow translates into um activism or activist work or or just uh, ngo work or non-profit work I think the latter definitely does um, adventure because after, you know, I think it takes courage to be an activist and only the adventurous uh, will venture into it or the very creative and artistic, you know, they are, they have, that's a whole different dream of adventure, you know, and I classify Anjali, uh, our colleague, the president, president of AGAP as one of those, she has this very artistic uh, inclination um, and yeah, so activism needs courage. Uh, first of that's the first requirement. And yeah, I think it does. And then for our purposes, of course, for a climate action NGO, the love of nature is, has to be, you cannot be passionate without uh, loving uh, the, uh, loving nature. And uh, that's what I think drives our, our urge to save it. You're absolutely right. Um, because I believe in the same thing. And, and uh, I, I see that it's, it's present this, I mean, you can observe this kind of uh, behavior, I would say, in in uh, not only you and I and Dr. Anjali, but also I think a lot of other people that I know who are involved in some kind of activism or some kind of work which kind of uh, propels people to change, you know. But I also have uh, another observation and I, I, I would like that to be validated from you. Um, do you think that being uh, a, a military kid in India or uh, being, uh, you know, um, a child uh, from, from a bureaucratic family, which has to travel a lot throughout India and sometimes abroad as well, that uh, regular consistent travel also forces you to choose professions or find those small little parts in your profession which, which help you travel more so that, you know, that, that intrinsic uh, nature which which wants to travel gets satisfied uh, yes that is a very selfish motive i think it's it's altruistic in a way but it is still selfish and yes um i mean i am this is not my house in the background i'm traveling i'm always tra even in the u.s because one cannot hold a job that allows you to i i'm independently employed so wherever there's work i go there and you know so and in my with my one big suitcase and this my smaller uh, bag of books um, and laptop, and um, uh, I think your question pertained to yes travel and also remember the traveler would be less materialistic because you live on less and you learn to live on less and you realize my goodness what is a houseful doing what 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 do you need a houseful of belongings for uh, actually this time I'm very unmoored and uprooted because I'm having to move again within eight months I'm having to move again from my house because the person who's renting me is selling it but i think yeah and i do not regret my my choice my life choices uh, which is very unusual it's not common it's a very privileged life and it's an extraordinary life i get to live on two continents deriving you know of course my my mother uh, my motherland is india i want to improve it change, bring changes in it but my home is still you know, in my inspiration and home are the U.S. for a quarter of a century now. So it's just, but yeah, it's just to sum up your, yes, I think that selfish motive of travel, if you may call, if you can call it selfish, I don't know, on World Environment Day, I'm going to climb up, up Lassen Mountain, which is one of the oldest volcanoes in America. On Saturday, I just realized it's the 5th from your email, from your PFA, that is actually the 5th of June, because in America, it's not observed on the 5th of June, we only celebrate Earth Day. But yes, oh my God, what greater privilege in life than to be 
you know, part of this rich uh, experience of travel and uh, constant change and experience of constantly new landscapes and culture. What greater privilege. But then again, uh, you, uh, it, 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 it needs you to relinquish and make sac sacrifices, which are worth it and easy for us army brats, I think, because we've moved all our lives. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for asking. I love that question. That's my favorite. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for answering it. Uh, so secondly, you know, because this is this is something uh, that I feel strongly about, and I sometimes I'm I'm not able to explain it as to why do I get this feeling that now I need to move again and do something else and meet more people and something. I, I'm not able to explain it. Everything is nice. You know, I have a nice setup. But then still, I just want to take my bag and just go somewhere else. And Please <laughs> enjoy your beautiful know. study for a month. <laughs> Maybe two weeks. <laughs> it's not, oh. it's been barely two weeks since you yeah. moved to this nice setting, to this lovely house. And yeah, I know I exactly know exactly what you mean. And you want to be on the road again? <laughs> <laughs> yeah absolutely <laughs> well if if the, if the covid situation yes. uh remains uh what it is i think uh i'll be i'll be here longer and uh, you know just <laughs> um well that's that's something that we can definitely discuss off the interview i would like to get back to our, our conversation um uh, because uh, you know we we uh army kids and army brats uh, we can continue having conversations about this and that and it will never really end um Dr. Buller, so you said, you know, plastic pollution is, is one of those big problems in Punjab. Where are we headed with respect to plastic pollution? I, I don't know. I, tend, I, I want to see the positive in this, especially with uh, the next generation uh, being more proactive um, and with air gap setting off in unprecedented directions, just with Ashma's... Uh, lovely visuals from yesterday on three different visuals on plastic pollution don't don't buy plastic bottle or coca-cola's exploitation of the environment plus a couple of other visuals she sent if we can just work to spread that word in the younger generation and make their parents stop buying pl plastic bottles um uh, and hurt hurt coca-cola and hurt um, fanta or hurt uh, what is that? My favorite brand, which I can't, which I've not been able to drink. Uh, Lahore Zira, uh, Lahore uh, something Zira. Uh, it's like Jaljira. I don't know if you've tasted it. Oh my God, it's called. It is delectable, but I've tasted it once because it comes only in plastic bottles and my sister gave it to me that I wouldn't buy. But yeah, uh, there is, there's no going, going around the fact that we are, uh, there, it is not sustainable and it has to end. Mm -hmm. Um, and all we can hope is that, you know, now the central government is, has an aim for an aim six months away now, uh, January of 2022. And then with all the data that you've sent us, Punjab is not the biggest polluter, but then Punjab is not the most popular state either. And that Goa is one of the biggest polluters. Would you believe it? I mean, <laughs> so that was very educating. But yeah, we um, and worse than that is in the US. It's worse, worse, much worse in the US. We don't have recycling bins. In my workplace, um, doctors are illiterate. I have a colleague who, you know, you have those paper towels in uh, when you wash your hands. I saw her. I saw her do it three times, and I had to say, "Hold on, whatever her name was, you know, hold on, L. Do you know what you're doing? I mean, what excuse? People are people are not even now not conscious of the fact that we are trampling on our legacy, and it's irreplaceable. Absolutely. I mean. Do you think it, it's it's mostly, uh, I mean, as far as, uh, you know, regular people are concerned or everyday uh, people who cannot make this a priority in their life, you know, not choosing what kind of uh, material they're using, especially when plastic is so omnipresent. Um, do you think it's it's a function of the behavior that out of sight, out of mind, if, if I cannot see plastic bottles strewn around uh, in my garden or, or in the park, then I'm generally not concerned about it because I think they are going to the right place. They are being managed uh, well. Do you think the developed countries have that kind of uh, a behavior towards plastic pollution? Yeah, the developed countries probably yes. I mean, especially especially North America. They are ter North America is terrible. In I think in most airports in the U.S. or at least half the airports that I've passed through, I don't see recycling bins recycle bins it, it takes an effort to find a recycle bin to carry your uh, newspaper around till you actually find one 
uh, it, that's a problem. Um, I think people, yeah, people are not even thinking about it. That that process, that process of uh, self interrogation or even uh, even reflection, that reflection has not is not. It's not the priority, and I think. And with the economic upheaval that COVID has brought about, irrespective of the fact that COVID has caused environmental plastic pollution to treble, or I don't know, more than treble, quadruple, I don't know the exact numbers, because of all the disposable, uh, the disposable culture getting, you know, more, uh, more strident because of uh, aseptic precautions uh, during COVID. I think um, it's going to get worse with this economic upheaval because when your own survival is at stake, when you don't know when you're, you know, you are not, these are things that, you know, the self-actualization again, uh, this self-actualization comes after your basic needs are satisfied. And what my one, my one big fear is it's not going to get better because again, people are not going to reflect on the environment necessarily, uh, though the voices uh, against uh, voices for climate action politically are growing even in this country, which is really the biggest culprit where I am currently. Uh, even though they are growing more strident, I think people uh, are so so taken up by every. You know, there's a uh, today uh, one a pediatric hospital in Colorado. The, I think it's called the Children's Hospital of Colorado has declared a pediatric mental health emergency in, uh, in America uh, because of uh, the COVID isolation. And kids are committing suicide because they don't get on baseball teams, and and similar things that are left last week in behind in India. I mean, orphans. I don't know, thirty or forty orphans in Delhi alone from COVID, and and it is a middle class which is also which is affected now. The middle class is such a such a big chunk of the Indian population, and that's where most of the activism and you know reflection and self actualization would come about. That would that could bring change. Yeah, I think it it might get worse before it get gets better i think it's just that yeah the self-actualization especially and then i think this you you hinted to me that uh, when when we talked to this podcast that you're going to come up with this question later on about why are smaller cities less concerned and why is all activism in bigger cities maybe because bigger bigger cities have you know i don't know uh, more self-actualizers for whatever reasons um maybe more exposure to culture the arts i don't know academics discussions enclaves where you know people actually you know, think tanks whatever so yeah more globalized a more cosmopolitan atmosphere so more exposure to other cultures or you know so maybe perhaps a little uh, a mind that's more open to self-actualization that was a long winding answer i'm sorry but yeah this is this is what i think absolutely i mean um so i mean let me let me just uh, recap the answer a little bit uh, so uh, because i i spent a year in japan and i think uh, in 2019 and and japan has the highest per capita consumption of plastic single use plastic in the world uh, greater than the us greater than australia which again are you know very high con consumers of single use plastic as well um and what i could see was that uh, people do deal with the waste in 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 a way which makes them okay about it um, because, you know, it goes to a certain place and then they don't really care what happens to it afterwards. Uh, ultimately, most single-use plastic in Japan is incinerated, which is they just burn it off because they don't have, uh, you know, any means to uh, use it judiciously or recycle. Recycling also is is kind of um, something which, which doesn't really happen. I think... Uh, I saw a John Oliver episode and in which uh, he, he basically says around only around 9% of all plastic bottles, etc. are recycled. Um, or what happens uh, with developed countries like North America, in Europe and Japan, Australia, etc. is that they ship out their waste uh, to countries like India, like Malaysia. And it was uh, quite a big statement that Malaysia made in 2019 when they refused all the waste coming from Japan to uh, their shores. Uh, although it's still continuing, but but they uh, started taking action against it, and now most of the e-waste in the world goes to Ghana. So it, it's it's something that if it if I can't see it, if it is not in inside, then I don't care about it. And I think when we talk about places like Punjab and Goa in India, which are uh, economically slightly more developed than the rest of the country, um, and people have higher standards of living. Uh, they would consume more till the time their areas are clean. Uh, they, they don't really care about what's happening to the plastic. But 
then again, this this brings me back to what John Oliver's episode was talking about. Um, he said in the 60s and the 70s, the US had a similar problem because plastic had just started becoming, uh, you know, usable in, in everyday forms like polythene bags, etc. And people didn't know what to do about it. Uh, waste was such a big problem in the US in the 60s. Uh, cars were thrown directly into the rivers and plastic was strewn everywhere. Milk cartons you could see flying around and uh, whatnot. And then suddenly they started cleaning it up. At the same time, Japan did it. Europe did it. They had stronger rules, but they didn't care where the waste was going. So till the time we can push it aside, nobody cares about it. But when it comes to your doorstep, which is actually happening in India right now, when you know we have storms in, in North India right now, and the plastic, you can actually see the plastic just strewn around in the parks, wherein we hire people to actually clean those parks. Now the nature is just throwing it all back in. We saw the typhoons in, in uh, the eastern and western coasts of India, just nature just throwing back all the waste it had on, on the beaches. And that Do you think that's part of the problem that the behavior that we have developed that uh, inconsiderate consumption without thinking where the material is coming from and where it will end up in the future that's leading to to our uh, plastic waste uh, conundrum when we're not asking coca-cola what they're doing and why they're doing it that's right yes uh, that is part that is one one limb of the problem definitely um, and again i think travel is the cure for it i think uh, the arts uh, less consumerism can happen if people travel more, expose themselves more to nature and uh, indulge in the arts. Ma'am, one more question that I wanted to ask uh, was, and, and you already hinted at it in your previous answer, um, was as to when you, you know, th there was a statement that you made which, which really, uh, you know, kind of shocked me as, as a non-medical personnel, but at the same time uh, kind of made me curious that when you said doctors were illiterate, Oh really? I can I can write two books about it, <laughs> two volume uh, book about it. Yeah. Jalandhar itself has around some eight hundred uh, Medicare institutions, which sometimes uh, you know the administration, local administration, Jalandhar claims that it is the highest density of medical in uh, Medicare institution in Asia. So a million plus city has around eight hundred Medicare institutions. That means a lot of doctors. What do the doctors in Jalandhar need to do against plastic pollution? Uh, uh, what we call a, what we are calling a green hospital campaign. It is uh, now the problem is what, and we discussed this once at an impromptu meeting where uh, you you may not have been present, but I did send a little sum up uh, in the hospital in Pims. Uh, what what is what would it take for these very and mostly women, women women doctors are very open to this green hospital idea, but but their primary motive is, um, you know, profit, all these private institutions. And uh, one particular hospital, which, I, which will go unnamed at, this, at the moment, in a prominent uh, medical institution in Jalandhar has been accused of um, price gouging for, as far as COVID testing goes and people have gone to court and got their money back, etc. And that particular institution has very, has very aware and very educated uh, America returned. I'm not saying America returned. Doctors are more educated, but more, what I mean is more exposed to the world. Kind of uh, doctors who are running uh, the hospital, who are open to the idea, but then they're diverting uh, uh, Pallavi, who's in, who's taken up that particular hospital, to the business and uh, managers or supply persons who are in charge of say, we just start with a small you know, one small, let's just start, stop these disposable trays that let's, let's, and we sent around pictures from Fortis and those acrylic, acrylic utensils that are easily, easily washable. And all wards are using it, including the COVID wards, because they're washable, the virus is washed off. So she was diverted to so many different people. And so the lower it goes in the, in that, in that hierarchy, okay, they are, of course, that's a department. We feel like it's more an excuse than anything else. If you're really interested, if you're really interested in the environment, then you will initiate the change. It, and it should be a priority. It, if it's, if the environment is not anyone's priority, they are illiterate. I mean, doctors, engineers, the uh, less educated, the more educated, army officers, whatever, whatever your profession. Because it is the most pressing, it is the most pressing uh, catastrophe of, of two generations of the century. And if you are not working towards improve, lessening the your carbon footprint, you are not literate. 
So that is maybe the short answer. But these doctors, yeah, they are educated, especially the women. I'm going to keep pointing out the women. Women, I don't know, tend to maybe because of the mother mothering instinct and the desire to leave the world a better place for their kids. Uh, just evolution wise. So the women, these women are very evolved, but they are directing Pallavi to these managerial people who may have a, you know, who have no exposure to the outside world. The main motive is profit and they are being, and okay, how much does this cost? This is cheaper. It is disposable. Our consumers, the patients are paying lakhs for, I don't know, COVID beds or whatever other beds. They are, they demand disposables and that see, the population is illiterate. So the illiteracy is across the board. And that's where your school campaign is so so noble and so pressing at the moment. Because can we hope the next generation would get better? Uh, yes, there's a hope. And maybe maybe uh, maybe go back and lecture their parents and grandparents. That's, yeah, the illiteracy is, uh, is across professions. But when I mention, when I say doctors are illiterate, I guess because that's my, my profession and that makes, that frustrates me more because it's a, it's a major health crisis of a generation. And my colleagues are tearing down six layers of paper towels to clean their hands after washing them. What the heck's going on? It is, it is a tragedy of profound proportions, you know. And then, of course, there's just some that Geneva, the group of doctors, I don't know, thousand doctors who marched in Geneva to the WHO that I've sent you. I read it in a so maybe some doctors are working towards it. But in general, they are environmentally illiterate. I assert that with confidence. Wow, that is such a strong statement. I completely agree with you that uh, no matter how uh, you know educated you are or how many degrees you have on your resume, it doesn't necessarily mean that you understand what we are doing to the planet or you care about it you're, you're illiterate and you're insensitive at the same time why is this knowledge is this insight into the environment and what we're doing with it needed by all professionals especially in countries like india where you know um, your ultimate life's goal is to reach a particular place where you can earn a decent living and provide for your family and then nothing else is expected of you uh, especially males and uh, in case of females i mean i'm again i'm it's it's very uh, not good to generalize but then you know most women in india are are thought of in a way that they need to pro nurture the family the man needs to provide for it and then they they are absolved of every other responsibility apart from this which other professionals do you think uh, need to know about this apart from doctors and you pointed out you know lawyers and engineers and um, army officers which other professionals need to know about this as well i think every single citizen of the earth needs to know about it and um, there was a time i didn't mention this uh, little uh, tangent in my trajectory professional trajectory i had a very dear uncle in uh, an indian um, uh, uncle in the US who had introduced me to the Sierra Club uh, 20 years ago and he passed away suddenly he was not even 60 I think so when he died I really was uh, it was the mo biggest loss I've suffered yet um, and he died and I was thinking of starting um, because he had introduced me to the outdoors in America I wanted to uh, start a an NGO that was my that uh, uh, NGO with the help of uh, contributions from all our friends to uh, take kids outdoors because I've been volunteering with the Sierra Club taking inner city kids because inner city kids in America they're generally poor and they don't have exposure to the same camping, fishing, hiking, mountaineering, skiing uh, uh, options that uh, uh, middle class kids do and usually whites, white middle class kids or even brown uh, Indians if they choose to because the Indians are pretty well off. So it's, it's funny um, and then I was thinking that would be the biggest contribute that would be the biggest contributor to his legacy, in my opinion. So now I'm backing up. I'm telling you this little tangent because it didn't work out. I contacted the Bombay National History Society, National History Society, and contributed some money to them and asked them, what can I do? And they told me, and they're a well-respected organization, a 200-year-old or something. You probably you probably know about them. But they pointed me to Harike. They said, oh, there are some nature reserves in Punjab. You can take kids there. Because I was thinking, oh, my God, I'll have to plan take treks to Manali or this where will I take kids in? Saurabh, you and I are lucky. We were raised, again, in lush cantonments with picnics and, I mean, uh, picnics, wild picnics. I mean, randomly, not picnic spots, you know, waterfalls near Babina, Jhansi, wacky adventures. Uh, so, uh, so wacky accidents, you know, wacky, crazy army officers with their kids and wives going off into the night sailing on motorboats. I mean, 
you know, it's just because we, and how, who would not love nature with that kind of upbringing, you know, but, but, it, but people, I've, I've seen this personally, people who are farmers, they don't have to be told about saving the environment, you know, they know, they, they go out in the fields, they commune with nature, even farmers, kids who are still farming, unless you actually personally experience nature, that's the first step to loving the environment. No question. No, there's no question about that. So I think we need to just expose kids. Sort of by person, I really feel, I want, my dream is for AGAP to get enough funds to even, to start that as an offshoot. Maybe Bageshwar's department, his little committee, he takes out kids to the Kanjali and points out trees to them. He used to do that in Dehradun when he was doing his master's in, for, in forestry. This is going to be, a, I mean, the kids writing essays and letters, that is your wonderful, wonderful work that you're doing for every month a new theme and all is wonderful but actually and some of them do get to go to places uh, apj school i'm sure the kids go out to lovely places in their holidays they're well off but then there are kids who, are, who don't have that opportunity there are many kids who do not have the top that opportunity and we if we if we inculcate that at that level we don't have to say anything we don't have to we don't have to preach a gap doesn't have to preach anymore you know it's just it'll come it'll come but yeah every citizen of the earth has to work towards it uh, Tinu, Tinu goes on all those tracks. Pallavi is yearning to go on tracks. Ashma, Neha, all of us love nature. Sanu kisi ne, you know, force karke ega apchini paya. You know, there's a hega sadich because we know it's, how can we lose nature? You know, it's, we're losing sleep over it. Yeah. The, the, the question uh, though still remains, don't you think? I mean, so uh, idly, uh, uh, Professionals in small towns would uh, have different priorities from professionals in, in big cities. And um, we kind of, uh, you know, look at what is happening in big cities, take inspiration from it, and uh, then, you know, start emulating it. Unfortunately, we, we are not having enough good role, role models from, uh, you know, bigger cities in India, or at least the cities that you would relate to. You know, something is happening in Chennai, a person in living in Punjab or Haryana might not relate to him. And the same goes for somebody living in uh, Kerala might not relate to some uh, something happening in Kolkata. Um, when when those things are not happening and, you know, there is, uh, there is a systemic uh, way, there's a systemic effort by uh, you know the industrial political corruption to uh, kind of um, you know not or, or not give importance to plastic pollution at all then the people living in small towns they do not have those avenues of inspiration and all these things again you know nature uh, loving nature and going on camps and everything is something that people in delhi would be doing chandigarh would be doing and then it percolates to ludhiana jalandhar and amritsar later on right um, do you think, uh, and that is why I personally think that, uh, you know, professionals in, in small towns need to take up uh, these activism uh, efforts on their own now because nobody else is coming to save them. So to bring about that understanding, what, what else do you think uh, can we do? And is it because uh, we, can, we can change the kids and, but then again, you know, uh, how do we change the adults? How do we get them moving? That's the big question. I mean, we we have inherent uh, motivations, all of us at AGAP, but others, educators, teachers, lawyers, they, they don't. I think Saurabh, um, lawyer, we have uh, Harleen. Uh, Mr. Sidhu is a paralegal social activist. Um, we have we have the two sharks sitting in Delhi asking for rupees seven lakh to represent us in the National Green Tribunal. They're also lawyers. They're not members of A Gap, of course. If anything, anti A Gap. But but I think um, uh, Sarab, it ha we have to come down to the we, we have to uh, uh, march in the streets, and that was the plan. Uh, that was my plan, and that remains my plan uh, later this year when things clear a little bit, um, uh, and we just go. Uh, we march. We do street protests. And we uh, uh, and we get the media on our side, and uh, radio, uh, radio Mirchi, uh, some people, and then All India Radio has a couple of very sagacious uh, women presenters who had interviewed me vaguely in the beginning somewhere, but I have not had the ch time to chase them. I think the media um, and activism on the streets, and now and uh, what about um, uh, Mr. Uh, Bahugana, who just passed away? I was just thinking, I was noting. I mean, this man was a saint. A saint for the environment. What are what can we what can we do to um, 
what can we do to have a na national level meeting or a, a, or a regional North Indian meeting or go or go there? Uh, you know, we are all middle class professionals in AGAP, the 12 or six, seven of us who are active. Go there and commune uh, with him, with his uh, uh, followers, with his wife who's still living there in uh, that uh, village in Uttarakhand, wherever it is, where the Chipko movement happened. And um, come back renewed and energized and hit the streets. Activism is sacrifice, activism is courage, and activism is getting a, get ready to get arrested. And, and that's not uncommon in, in the US. I mean, I, I'm our Sierra Club colleagues. I have a colleague called Susan who's been arrested two or three times. Been, uh, it, it, they were, I think once it was during the Vietnam War. She's older. So they were protesting. She was in college or something. She was put in jail for a couple of days. And and now, so Extinction Rebellion, Rebellion has that, you know, you have to be some criteria. Okay, what are you, an artist? What can you do? Can you write? Can you can you cre create songs for uh, the climate action? Are you willing to, or a category that's willing to get arrested? And that's what it, it has come to now. With the current stalemate in Punjab, with the uh, with, and uh, lawyers asking us for the seven lakhs in fees to represent us in the National Green Tribunal, what does it come to? Street protests? I mean, what can what else can we do? <laughs> we can't afford even to represent uh, the to uh, raise or uh, take uh, the Punjab government to court for creating all that confusion. We will eventually. I'm, I'm pretty positive people. We are working on it right now, but. Hitting the streets with protests, lying down on roads. What are the farmers doing? I take inspiration from the farmers' movement, immense inspiration. You know, I spent a week there in January. There were old women who were climb. You know, we had we were staying in a bus stand in Bahadurgarh on the Tikri border, and old women would come climb up steps with their uh, canes to take showers every other day. There was a geyser there. There was no other hot water, and. Uh, I was totally floored. I was I was humbled and floored. This is the only way to do it, you know. Just sit and protest. Yeah, that's that's what that's what has. Uh, there's no option left, you know. At the most, uh, yeah. At the most basic level, that's what our generation. That's what we can do, and then keep working on the next generation, which, which you are doing so so well. You and Ashna, and yeah. I think that. Uh... That's a very apt uh, description of, uh, you know, what we ultimately need to do, because uh, otherwise things are not changing at the right pace, at least. Right. Ma'am, uh, before we conclude the episode, uh, you know, I, I would just like you, um, you know, it, it is like listening from the horse's mouth. Uh, would you like to summarize AGAP's journey from August 2020 when, uh, you know, it was it was uh, the, the idea was founded? Uh, till today and what has uh, that journey taught us and led us to this this ultimate uh, decision of uh, you know uh, asking the government tough questions uh, taking them to court and uh, whenever the situation uh, you know allows maybe uh, going out in the streets and protesting. thank you what a nice question Saurabh if anything it it is cathartic to answer this question uh, considering the obstacles we are facing and our constant, uh, my constant uh, refrain that we are, uh, you know, we are, uh, we, <laughs> that I'm impatient to see um, things go faster. Uh, that's, I'm still impatient. I think we, I, I should remain impatient. Uh, so it started in August uh, with uh, some, a uh, few of us who are uh, Bageshwar, myself, um, Jaskirat in Ludhiana. Uh, who who I'd met through Ecosic, and um, who continues to be actually he's not in, in the group anymore, but he's doing a lot of data collection for me. That Kerala court he did the uh, did it for me. So he's a very so at that time I was you know I I've learned. I think I'll, what I can tell you is what I've learned in the past nine months since we conceptualized a gap and now it's a registered organization with its own president, its own office bearers. Uh, but initially I was thinking of okay. This is what we can do. Let's write an open letter. There were a bunch of people who were protesting against it. Oh, there's a mafia and it's going to come after us. Our lives are a threat. And I said, okay, what is our life? I mean, you know, and some of, I was not the only one. I think Bageshwar was also saying the same thing. But then it filled, it, that open letter, okay, let's try other means first. So we tried some other means like calling up uh, the PPCB, CPCB, the government official route, 
that lasted on that uh, oh that lasted for maybe a month or two then i came here then when i went back in january uh, in december when we started uh, then anjali and i sat over i don't know coffee i just met her by chance and then we thought okay let's get going uh, we uh, women uh, we'll do it and so after that uh, uh, through sun sichewal learning that even sun sichewal doesn't have, it doesn't have the answer as we had expected learning that you know what what do you call uh, idolize uh, you know idolatry is you know sun sichewal the king of the environment environment activism he has all the answers he did not have all the answers he was as frustrated as us as we were so he dictated a letter that open letter he dictated a similar one to the ppcb or cpcb under our eyes i mean he has a secretary who was doing it nothing has happened january 5 months now and then we started getting people like you yourself on board then we found uh, pallavi was always interested so and then you are actually really you've streamlined the whole process of meeting of making it a more professional ngo and the school kids move a movement was totally lost because nobody was working on it and you really your stewardship has really really gone far on that and now persons like mr k s pannu are taking us seriously he would not he would just curtly answer my questions on the uh, uh, on the phone you know and till one day i said pannu sahab to see patani menu ki samjhao yaar but i'm not the kind of person you think of you know i'm sorry to say if i sound snobbish but it's like an ngo that comes up and just starts working with the municipal corporation collecting waste for you know two weeks and publicizes themselves i'm in it till we see a resolution and then mr batra suggested i go actually meet him because you know in india that that counts for a lot you know that personality thing or that clicking thing and mr k s panu has been very helpful in guiding us now he's getting he's helping us even more than he did after our meeting in april and now we are heading to the national green tribunal on the way what we have missed out on is our con- contacting with uh, contacts with other passionate people now that now that mr bhogan has passed away very a big 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 tragedy but how do we how do we uh, pick up from his movement because that is activism in the gandhian style or sacrifice self sacrificing activism uh, which i am a big fan of because i'm a frugal person i don't like spending money i think there's something about he's lived it with few clothes and a little you know i love that i love that concept i can't practice it but i'm unable to but uh, i love that and that inspiration and then it's like people have joined us then xr a person from extinction rebellion kerala he worked in chandigarh for a while he's tried to help us but he's not available most of the time the problem with this is we are also there are also young professionals like yourself who have to earn a living not you know older middle aged people like me who can ease off on learning earning a living because our lives are you know our life spans are shorter than yours now and we have set goals you know uh, already made decisions about you know family life and all that but um it is it has come a long way and it's, and it is oh my god don't uh, i have really high hopes from a gap now and uh, it's going to be i think it's going to be a national force uh, that's what i envision yeah the team is excellent absolutely i think i think i believe in the same thing and i i don't want it to just be a national force i want it to be a global force uh, just like uh, all the other wonderful organizations uh, that they are uh, out there already i think uh, we we definitely need to join hands um, i i don't think i i don't see any reason or purpose of being an isolated organization trying to do it on your own i i just don't see it i think the world has moved much beyond that especially after the covid uh, you know entire catastrophe um thank you so much dr navneet for being on the podcast last two questions uh, one line questions uh, which we can uh, probably use and uh, you know to to share with others as well um what career advice would you like to give young students and professionals who would uh, maybe like to follow a career trajectory as yours follow your heart and things fall in place they fall in place um um and you know it's it's live an extraordinary life you all are kept you all are able to live an extraordinary life especially if you're if you have nurturing parents and you're from a middle class household there's no nothing unaccomplishable think big and live an extraordinary life amazing um one liner for the world you know which which one sentence which you think makes the world a better place 
<laughs> oh no! no these, these are statements with you know you you never know uh, who gets inspiration from these statements. If if it is out there in in the in the internet uh, in the world today, if if such a statement is out there, you never know who's going to listen to it, and maybe uh, that person is in the right frame of mind to take inspiration from it. So that is why we 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 owe it to the world to actually share such sentences. Practice compassion every day. Start with self compassion and spread outwards. That is my one uh, one big uh, message for everyone. Yeah, and you'll never be unhappy. Never. Not you won't have an unhappy moment in your life. And I promise you this. Yeah. Practice compassion. Start with self compassion. And there's so much to make better in the world. So much, which you all know. Thank you, Sarah. It's so fun. Such fun. Amazing. It was fun. Thank you so much, Dr. Buller, for uh, taking your time. Bye.